Well, good afternoon, everyone. We want to welcome you to Parrot Methodist Church for our Tuesday service for the Ministerial Alliance Holy Week services. We want to welcome you all. We are so glad that you are here. It is a privilege to host you today, and we look forward to sharing together in lunch after the service. Um, you are uh, welcome to travel any way you would like to. The fellowship hall is next door. Um, the doors that we will use are on this side in the bigger parking lot. You can come back outside like some of you came in, or you can take this hallway and go out and turn to your left and get there. If you need to use the restrooms, the restrooms are down this hallway as well uh, today. But we do want to welcome you. It is so good to have the opportunity uh, to be able to not only share together in these special services, uh, this tradition that is so rich here in Nacogdoches, but isn't it good this year to visit various locations and see where people are and be able to make those connections. And so it's a nice Nice, uh, nice thing. And then I heard, I don't know if this is correct, but I heard at the end of the week there will be a prize given for the best lunch that was served uh, for those five days. And so um, I think whoever wins that gets to host the lunches next year is what, what I was told. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, what a wonderful time of year that it is for us to celebrate and we are thankful for your presence here today. I'm going to ask that you would stand with us, and you have your worship folder there. There is also the screens available, and we are going to say the Lord's Prayer together, and then I'll have you remain standing for our call to worship and for our first uh, song today. Let us say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope and my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have lived from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Let's remain standing and sing together the great hymn of the church, And Can It Be? You can find that in 363 in your hymnal, or the words will also be on the screen. We will sing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5.
Tis mercy of immense and free for all oh my God it found out me long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature chains fell off my heart was free i rose went forth and followed thee my chains fell off my heart was free i rose went forth and followed thee no condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness did sing this out bold i approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through christ my own bold i approach the eternal Amen. <coughs> Please be seated. <coughs> okay. uh, you can see that our offering will go to benefit our CASA office as we receive this offering today. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and help us to receive our tithes and our not our tithes and offerings. That's just a habit of mine. Just our offering today. And I do want you to thank, if you would, uh, Dr. Lee and her husband, Mr. Kim, who are here with us today. They are wonderful musicians, and we are thankful for them. Lord, as we receive this offering to bless a organization in this community that works to make sure that foster kids have what they need for advocacy and for support, we pray, Lord, that you would bless and uh, this offering and bless those who give today. May it be used for your kingdom and for your sake. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let us stand together and respond to our offering by singing the doxology. God bless you for your gifts today. Please be seated. The Gospel of John. It's the 12th chapter, verses 20 through 36. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also." Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, the light is in you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that the, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of the light. The word of God for the people of God. all praises to God, the head of my life, we come here today just to lift up and glorify our Heavenly Father. As we observe Holy Week, we're following in Jesus' footstep. We're following his footsteps, what he was doing in Holy Week. We see Jesus was anointed at Bethany. Jesus rode in to, Je uh, to Jerusalem on a donkey. And now Jesus is telling us, he's predicting his death. So he's telling us about his death. So as we observe Holy Week, as we approach Resurrection Sunday, we have the tendency to focus more on the theologies of atonement than any other time of the year. As we try to understand the death of Jesus. But since we do mostly focus on the death of Jesus, my title for my message will probably help you a lot. The title for my message is The Word Became Flesh and Dwell Among Us. So you're probably wondering, if we're focusing on Resurrection Sunday, if we're talking about Jesus' death, why is the title of her message, The Word Became Flesh and Dwell Among Us? Jesus in our scripture today, John, the Apostle John, wants us to understand, God wants us to understand that we will never understand 
the death of Jesus without first realizing that it's built around the restoration of relationships that demand a response and a decision from mankind. A response that came from the beginning. It all started with Jesus' incarnation. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That whosoever, it calls for a response from us, yes. so I'm calling for a response from you. Yes. That whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Our scripture reading today, it's all about relationships. It's about relationships. As John introduces the Greeks that had come to Jerusalem to worship, and although they were Gentiles, they were followers of the Jewish religion, but they had not converted to Judaism. However, they had heard about Jesus, and they wanted to meet him. They're telling us something there. When we hear about Jesus, we have to want to meet him. We have to want to know more about him, more about him and study. And we know the Greeks, the Greeks would study. They would catch something. If they got a hint of it, if they liked it, they didn't stop. They continued to study. They continued to study and to find out as much as they could about what the topic they were interested in, which is now, it's all, it's all about Jesus. And so they wanted to meet Jesus. We are to want to meet Jesus. They wanted to meet him. So they asked Andrew and they asked Philip if they could speak to Jesus. We must remember every word, every scripture, in the Bible is there for a reason. We have the tendency to read over a lot and think that it's not important. Right. You know, we, we, we grasp the few words, the scriptures that we're familiar with, and then we overlook a lot. But it's a reason, it's there for a reason. Andrew and Philip were the first two disciples that Jesus called. Therefore, their presence established a connection between the calling of the first Jewish disciples and the arrival of the first Gentile disciples. Mm -hmm. Just as the raising of Lazarus from the dead and the anointing of Mary by Mary foreshadowed Jesus' glorification, the arrival of the Greeks foreshadowed the uh, church's future mission to the Gentiles and the inclusion of the Gentiles, the inclusion of us in God's promise of universal salvation. Oh, we tend to skim over Jesus' response when he heard the Greeks were looking for him. Jesus knew that this was a sign. He knew that this was a sign that he had been waiting for. And he knew that this was the hour. This was the hour that had come for him to be glorified. For Jesus to die meant to be glorified because he knew that after his death, he would, he would rise to glory because he knew that now that the Gentiles uh, had, come, had begun to turn to him, his witness would begin to spread outside of Israel through the preaching of his disciples. He knew that now it would be seen that he was a savior, not just of the Jews, but of the whole world. His work on earth had come to an end. And because it had always been God's plan that only after Jesus' death would the Holy Spirit be sent to live in the disciples. Right. For it was through the power, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples, that we, that we would spread the gospel all over the world. Right. So Jesus' death is both necessary and life-giving because as a result of his death, a community is formed. A community is formed that is described as much fruit. Discipleship is defined as serving Jesus and making it clear that the goal of such service is restoring the relationship with, with God and Jesus. For it is through Jesus that death, through Jesus' death, that all people will be drawn to him yes. and become 
the children of light. So throughout the Bible, this new relationship is described as new birth or eternal life, the final step in the offer, in the offer of a new life. Because of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, God's relationship to the world is changed forever. But for Jesus' death to result, to re for Jesus' death to result in reconciliation with God, it required action. It required action and response from us. We must decide to, to believe in Jesus. We must decide to believe in Jesus. Yes. We will not understand the death of Jesus without first understanding uh, Jesus' life, without first understanding the incarnation of Jesus. Right. We will not understand how God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son if we don't follow in Jesus' footsteps to follow from that very beginning of his word. From the very beginning, God gave us, when he said God, God so loved the world, he loved us, and he gave us his son, but he told us what we had to do. We had to believe in his son. We have to believe in his son in order for us to have eternal. God wants us to live with him forever. But in order for us to do that, in order for us to have eternal life, we have to believe in him. Right. So the word became flesh and dwelled among us. God himself walked among us to show us how it should be done, mm -hmm. to show us what we needed to do, to show us the response that he wanted from us. Without the word, without God loving us, without the word becoming flesh, we would not be talking about Jesus' resurrection. We would not be talking about Jesus' death. So any conversation that we have about Jesus' death should always start with Jesus' incarnation. It should start with the word, with the word becoming flesh with us in order for us to understand that something is expected of us, in order for us to not just expect God and Jesus to do everything, to understand that he did this for a reason. He wanted us to live with him, but he wanted us to live with him uh, forever, but he wanted us to also to, to love him and to obey his commands. He wanted to be able to use us with Jesus no longer here on earth. He wants to be able to use us. We are supposed to pick up Take up, be Jesus' disciples, follow in his footsteps, to take up, be his ambassadors, be his representative, to take up and do the work that Jesus was doing. Yeah, right, right. So the theologies of atonement that we focus on as we try to understand the death of Jesus are identified as ransom, as sacrificial, and, and, and moral influence. Ransom in which Jesus is the act of a payment that brought freedom from sin and death, sacrificial in which Christ's death is understood as a sacrifice necessary to atone for human guilt and sin, and moral influence. Jesus' death is understood as a model of moral behavior uh, because it reveals how much God loves us. However, the Apostle John is telling us uh, that none of these theories uh, present a doctrine that matches the Apostle John understanding of the, of the cross in our scripture today. We all understand that Jesus uh, was a propitiation, a propitiation for our sins. We all understand that, and, and the Apostle John is not telling us any different. He's just telling us that when we just focus, when we focus on these atonement theologies, we're expecting God to do, God and Jesus to do everything. And the Apostle John wants us to know that we have our responsibility. John, the disciple that Jesus loved, does not see Jesus as a vision uh, of ransom, a victim of ransom, or a substitution. Jesus is not a victim. At his death, he is in complete control uh, of, of everything that he does right. because he realized, he paused for a minute, that human side of him paused for a second, and he thought about it, but he realized that it was to die that he had come into the world to make mankind's punishment. Now, moral influence captures part of John's doctrine of salvation through Jesus, but it overlooks our, our responsibility. 
It overlooks the demand for human response and decision, which is essential. It's essential uh, part of Jesus' glorification. Because again, we're Jesus' hands, we're his feet. He, the disciples started, he had started to the disciples, but as disciples, you know, we're, we're students, we're following him. So we were to continue in spreading the good news. Therefore, John is describing the theologies of atonement as a theology of reconciliation uh, that attempts to explain how God and humanity were reconciled uh, in Jesus' death under the umbrella of sacrifice. And sacrifice is one way of understanding reconciliation. But my sisters and brothers, it's not the only way. It's not the only way. What is lacking in the theologies of atonement, and I can't say it enough, what is lacking is, is, uh, is action, is a decision from us to believe in Jesus. Uh, that is, and that is what required, that is what required from the very beginning of John 3.16, God told us how we could be saved, how we could have eternal life. So as a result, you know, if we choose, uh, we, we tend to choose uh, the divine, either the, the mankind, we, uh, between mankind and it's one-sided, and there is a, ten a tendency to either favor uh, the side of divine initiative, which is sacrifice and ransom, or human embrace of God, God's love, which is moral influence. And with either one, we, we are wanting God and Jesus to do everything. We wanted them to do everything, and we just sit back and, 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 and you know, we sit back and we, we get sad over what happened to Jesus at the cross. He didn't want us to get sad. He wants us to respond, to respond. Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew what he had been called for. But he's asking, John is asking us, do we know? Do we know, do we know what Je Jesus did at the cross, what he is asking of us, what our uh, action is? what action he want us to take. Our focus should always be steadfast on the inseparable interrelationship of both the divine, uh, the divine and the human because we understand that Jesus was both divine and human. Right. And that was what was revealed in the incarnation, the word becoming flesh. Jesus being both human and divine is the heart of us understanding the death of Jesus because it's a piece of his life. We can't just focus on Jesus' death and not his whole life, not from in, in the beginning. His, his relationship with God is an expression of his relationship with God, which began at the beginning. It began at the beginning, and for the apostle John, the theology of Jesus is not focusing exclusively on his death, but the incarnation, the reason, the reason, we have to think about the reason that he was sent. Not just that he was sent, not just how he suffered at the cross, but the reason that he was sent, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Because it is through Jesus' glorification, his death, his resurrection, and return to God, that God's promise for his people his, God's promises are fulfilled. And Jesus' life is the dividing line, the future in which the arrival of the Greeks required Jesus' death. So we're given, in closing, we're given two important contributions about reconciliation that makes relationship a serious theological category. Jesus' death is the ultimate expression of his relationship with God and his people. Jesus' death, the decision to believe and follow Jesus, is a decision that we're called to make to become a partner, to become a partner in that relationship. It's not just going to happen because we join church. It's not just going to happen because we're sitting in a pew every Sunday. But Jesus accepting it, accepting it, becoming a member of the community, it, 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 uh, the community of light, it's just like Jesus and God are bound together, then we are bound together. And that's what, that's what God was telling us when he said, you know, that he, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever 
whosoever believed in him would not perish but have an everlasting life. So we have to believe. When we talk about Jesus' death, we don't start a conversation, uh, you know, around the Easter, around resurrection, just focusing on Jesus' death. It's just like if we started a conversation about uh, one of our loved ones that died, and the only thing we talk about is the eulogy. We want to focus, we want to, fo we want to remember their whole life. So we want to remember Jesus' whole life, why he was sent. What is expected of us? How he gave us the Great Commission. He gave us the Great Commission in order for us to spread the good news, in order for us to be his hands and his feet, and for not for us to just sit on it in a pew. But he called for us. He called for us to be his, 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 his well, for us to be his hands, his feet for us to just spread, to spread the good news. And we have a responsibility. We must accept Jesus' offer of reconciliation to believe and come children of light. We must understand that God is a relational God, that it's all about relationship. And it started, he revealed how it's about relationship by Jesus being both human and divine, by Jesus showing us how it could be done, that we can't do it by ourselves. If we could do it by ourselves, then Jesus would not have had to be, you know, uh, the fl flesh would not have, the word would not have had to become flesh right. if we could have done it by ourselves. And so we have a responsibility. So today, the Apostle John wants us to realize, to understand what that responsibility is. He wants us to understand that in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made that have been made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. God walked with us. He talked with us. He walked with his uh, creation to show us how it could be done. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came to the Father. So we must understand that God is a relational God. We must understand that we have a responsibility, but we must understand in our conversation that it all started with the incarnation. When we want to understand Jesus' death, it all, we have to go back to his incarnation. We understand Jesus knew what he was called for, but he's questioning, the Apostle John is asking us today, oh, do we know what we, are we following Jesus? Do we know who we are following? Do we know why we're following him? Do we know why he came? Instead of focusing on his death, let us focus. Let us focus during uh, uh, Holy Week, during Resurrection Sunday. Let us focus on why he was sent because that's what Jesus focused on was why he was sent. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Watts, for a wonderful, wonderful message today. Let us uh, stand together and let's respond to the message by singing 301, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain.
Let's remain standing as we say together now the affirmation of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. Would you read along with me today? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living. <coughs> I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us sing now the glory of Patria as we prepare to leave today. and receive this blessing. And now may the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Grace and peace upon you today. You are valued and loved, and we are so thankful you are here with us. Let us now go to our fellowship hall next door and receive a lunch together. Let us pray before we leave. Father, would you bless our food and our time of fellowship? We pray all these things today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.